Hello, I'm Jonathan Green. Welcome to our Carfile special programme from the British International Motor Show at the NEC. Now, with doubts about the Earl's Court venue in London in the future, this particular venue at the NEC could well be the home of British motor shows for many years to come. Right here, right now. Every great party has its poopers, and although Mini are here, BMW aren't showing their full range. And up until recently, Mercedes weren't coming at all, but now they've taken a stand in Hall 2. Ferrari aren't also showing their full range, but the car that we all wanted to see is here, and it's right under the spotlight. It's big, it's red, and it's over there. The greatest Ferrari of all time, this is the Enzo, the hot new machine that everyone is talking about. Following the F40 and the F50, the Ferrari fans were expecting the F60 as the chosen name. Except that the others were anniversary models and the Ferrari 60th anniversary is still a few years away. Finally, at the launch in Tokyo, Ferrari curiously announced that the working title, the FX, until they realized that this car was going to be very, very special indeed and named it after their legendary founder, Enzo. This has Pininfarina design built in, but some aspects of its styling may shock at first glance. The reason is that it has the closest integration of F1 technology in a Ferrari road car to date. We're not going for looks here, but for practicality. The car needs to breathe to feed the huge V12 and to keep the brakes cool. The aerodynamics are critical to keep the Enzo stuck to earth when it's nearing warp back to three. Plus, there's no traditional manual gear change option, but it has a paddle system in sport and race settings. Brake discs are carbon fibre and the whole aerodynamic design is a balance between the need to suck in air for cooling while maintaining downforce and minimising drag. So here it is in the metal at the NEC and I have to say up close it really is quite awesome. But the most impressive thing about this car of course is under the body because the chassis is made of carbon fibre and aluminium honeycomb. So therefore it's built for low weight and high strength. Well, one look at the engine really takes your breath away. 660 brake horsepower, and incidentally, it's the fastest road car that Ferrari have ever developed. Now, if you fancy one of these in your driveway and you've got a friendly bank manager because you'll need one, Ferrari tell us that the estimated cost is £420,000. But your investment will be protected by the rarity of these cars. Ferrari are only making 399. That's just one less than they can actually sell. And the UK market is only earmarked for 25 of them, and already Ferrari collectors have got their name on all of them. So then, one more long, lingering look. Si, bellissimo. But if you don't have half a million to spend on the Enzo, then how are you going to get your thrills? Well, Peugeot have got a suggestion. If you were a fan of the driving dynamics of the 205, then you probably wouldn't be too bothered by its replacement, the 206, until now. This is the hottest 206 produced to go on showroom sale. It's the GTI 180. 
and compared to the regular 138 brake horsepower, this baby has a full-on 180 on tap. And you'll be able to tell the world that you have the fastest wheels on the block. By the unique 17-inch alloys, the rear spoiler, twin chrome tailpipes and colour-coded body details. But of course, the passers-by won't notice these details as you blur out of sight 60 in 7 seconds, reaching a top speed of 143 miles per hour. Funny how we love GTI badges in the UK because Peugeot are not using that name on the continent. If you bought one of these dudes in France, it'll be called a 206 RC. Now here, RC is what we call remote control model cars over here. So you can see why they keep the GTI in the UK. On the inside, it's got all those cliched car performance cues like the alloy pedals, the alloy gear knob, and of course, those figure-hugging seats. But I don't think girls are that impressed with my alloy gear knob, but that's another question. But I am impressed with that pair over there. We saw these two concept cars earlier this year at the Geneva Show, and appropriately, they're called spades and diamonds, hence the colours. But seen from the front, these 2 plus 2 Sport Coupés really do echo the Peugeot feline feel. Look at the windscreens on these concepts. They're bigger and more steeply raked than anything seen before on the Peugeot badge on it. The Spades version is black with a brilliant red interior, while the Diamonds version is brilliant red with a black interior. The RC Diamond comes with a petrol-powered 180 brake horsepower 2-litre engine, and the Spades carries a torque-heavy 2.2-litre diesel unit and puts out 175 brake horsepower. This may not sound impressive, but both power plants are said to take the cars from 0 to 60 miles per hour in less than 6 seconds, thanks to the carbon fibre for reducing weight. As with any hot car worth its weight these days, the shifting is done sequentially through the hydraulic 6-speed unit, and the clutch pedal has been chucked away. The platform in these vehicles comes from the 307. Inside, the seats are leather-covered, carbon fibre buckets with racing-style harness seat belts. Nice ones, Perjo. Any guesses what this is? Well, our viewers in the northeast just might have a clue. It's the new Nissan Micra, and in fact, it was built in Sunderland. And Nissan, in fact, have actually been testing it with some of the local drivers to just get some last-minute user feedback before its launch. Now, the first thing you notice about the new Micra are these rather quirky headlamps. They've got a special little wingtip sight here to allow the driver to get a better view of the perimeters of the car. Now, on a huge car, you might need a feature like this, but on the Micra, well, I don't know. It might spoil the front end just a little bit. And after all, the headlights are the eyes of the car. The new Micra enjoys the same high roof line as the outgoing model and is about three inches longer, so there's a little more room in the back. Plus, if you need flexibility, the rear seat slides forward and backwards. A neat trick. The car comes with a first in its class, an intelligent key system which opens the car when it senses you approaching. Plus, you don't have to muck about putting the key in anywhere to start the engine. Just flick the ignition once the car has sensed that you're its rightful owner. Now with this new car, Nissan really have tried to appeal to the younger driver rather than the little old lady on her way to church. And if you can't afford the Beetle or the Mini, well, this could well be the more stylish option. Do you ever get the feeling that car companies are running out of names for their new cars? Well, this is the new Vauxhall Mariva. We don't really know what Mariva is, but this little chap is the younger brother of the award-winning Vauxhall Zafira MPV. On the inside, the Mariva has the innovative flex system, which means you can go from a five-seater to a four-seater or even a single-seater without removing any seats. Clever, eh? The Mariva MPV was developed in conjunction with Vauxhall's Opel colleagues in Germany and with General Motors Engineering Center in Brazil, and the car will be made in Spain for the first sales to begin next spring. The power is provided by a couple of lively diesel and petrol engines, but the performance isn't really an issue here. Flexibility is. Vauxhall realised that their Zafira is the winning formula when the mantelpiece started to fill up with awards. Further customer feedback produced the idea of an even more flexible vehicle using the Astra wheel brace. 
And did you know that soon 40% of all Vauxhall cars will have moved away from saloon hatchback and hatchback variants to other types of vehicles? But would the ordinary user use this space system? The Safira's extra flip-up seats are useful when your kids are bringing friends home for the weekend, but musical chairs in the Mariva, is it really worth the extra cost? The Smart. A cute city car built to appease the green lobby, strict emission laws and deflect high fuel prices. We think of high centre of gravity, uncomfortable seats, noisy motorway ride and weak engine. Some things are neat like the interchangeable exterior panels, but these smarts may not be as desirable as they were when they first came out. So now MCC give us this, the Smart Roadster. It's 70 centimetres longer and 9 centimetres wider than the conventional Smart City Coupe. The engine is exactly the same, it's 699 cc's, but it's been enhanced in terms of its brake horsepower to 80. Woo! And on the inside, that power has been mated with a six-speed semi-automatic transmission in the like of the Chrysler Auto Stick. The ride height is also going to be better because they've lowered the centre of gravity and stiffened the suspension, so there shouldn't be as much roll in the corners. But I miss the interchangeable panels of the coupe, I hear you cry. Well, don't worry, the Roadster has the same, and for a price of between, what, 12 and 15 grand, I think when it stops raining in this country, it's going to be a very exciting car to drive. Well, we're glad that Volvo have realised that styling is just as important as functionality. Take a look at this. It's the brand new Sexy XC90. It's a full-blooded sports utility aimed directly at the American market. And there's nothing conservative about this. No, this is a 4x4 that will certainly rival the BMW X5. The Volvo company is now in Ford's domain, and of course, so is Land Rover. So, isn't the XC90 going to clash with the Discovery? Probably not, as the good old Disco is aimed at the serious mudlugger, while the Volvo is a style vehicle with some off-road potential. Peter Horbury and his design team have come up trumps again with a very handsome look and ergonomics behind the wheel that make the XC90 easy to drive, even on long journeys. The build quality is fantastic, there's plenty of space inside, but get this, you have seven, count them, seven seats as standard. And that means that Volvo are paying for blood in this sector. And with seven seats as standard, it's got its rivals worried. And they're BMW, Mercedes, and of course, the folks at Jeep. There you go, folks, you see? The Swedish have finally cracked it. They've got it cool. It's cool to be Swedish, at last. So you've been around the show and you've bought your dream car, but now, of course, it's time for that all-important personalised licence plate. And from the DVLA, I've got Damien Lawson, who's going to tell me how to do it. Damien, is this process as hard as I would have thought it might be? Absolutely not. Directly from DVLA, it's a really simple process, really simple and quick. Many numbers you can choose from, and here at the show, we have an interactive system where you can go in, choose your letters and number combinations to suit your needs. Let me give you an example of the new style registration numbers that are out now. You can choose your letters and number combinations. As an example, let's pick on you, Jonathan. M, E, that's, that's for me. me. Are you happy with that? Right. You have a new car this year, 02, which is the year of 2002. That's something to describe my driving. Let's have a look. I don't F -F -F. think you're pretty fast, Jonathan. Let's have a look. Are you slow? Well, I've just brought the Ferrari now. Have you got one of them? Oh, we got a Ferrari. Right, fine. Maranello. Maranello. I'll Perfect. have a look at that on your car. M, me too slow. How's that? It's about right for my Ferrari. Joking aside though, um, is it an inexpensive process? Because I always seem to think that these sorts of things will be very expensive. They not. DVLA, you can pick up a number plate for as little as £250 on the car. Simple process. It's a telesales facility at DVLA in Swansea. 
Okay, thanks very much for talking to us, Damien. Well, I've got my car, and I'm not so sure about the license plate. We'll have to think about that a little bit more. We'll take a short break. We'll be back with more from our car file special in a moment. Hello, I'm Jonathan Green. Welcome back to our car file special program from the NEC. What is it with Volkswagen and the names of their vehicles? They've certainly got a fair few names that their rivals can have a bit of fun at. The Passe for the Passat, the Boring Borer, the Sharon for God's sake, and now the all-new Twareg. Well, it's difficult to say and it's difficult to spell, but we're told that Tuareg is in fact the name of a tribe from the Sahara Desert. Now, they're famed for their dignity and their pride, but above all, their ability to adapt to difficult conditions. And now it all makes sense, now it all fits into place, because this is Volkswagen's first ever off-roader. At a length of over four and three quarter metres, the Tuareg is firmly aimed at the off-roader luxury market. May also attract people wanting a sporty luxury class estate car with a bit of off-roader ability, and that's fine. We've yet to drive this beast, but in theory it should cut the mustard on the tarmac as well as on the muddy slopes. The wheels get automatically variable power, where up to 100% of traction force is delivered on either axles, dependent on where power is needed. The styling has a sensible short overhang and high ground clearance brief and it's even designed to roll an amazing 45 degrees without tipping over. Then if you're on standard rows, a flick of the switch tells the Volkswagen Touareg you need a little bit more comfortable ride. And if the car has a pneumatic suspension option fitted, the car is automatically lowered when the speed gets to about 50 miles per hour. Clever, eh? And if you want space, you've got it. Open the huge tailgate and just open the window to bung in this week's shopping or your holiday baggage. Plus, with its towing capacity of three and a half tons, the Tourag can lug the biggest of caravans and trailers. There's a lot going for the Tourag, and if you're about to write a check for a new BMW X5, well then put your pen away and take a look at this first. On the negative side though, it's a little bit bland overall. There's no real futuristic flair or any aggressive 4x4 design. And there's also no clues as to where Volkswagen are really going in the future with this car. The back end is, quite frankly, a little bit frumpy for my liking, but if you do want a positive note about the Touareg, it's got 313 brake horsepower, and if you own one of these, you'll be the owner of the most powerful diesel passenger vehicle on the market. And from the VW European off-roader to Japan's latest offer, the Toyota Land Cruiser. Now, no jibes about bland Japanese styling, because this car was born out of the European Toyota Design Center. The new model is aimed at the core sports utility market and will replace the current Colorado model. This car will simply be known as the Toyota Land Cruiser. The Land Cruiser Amazon though will continue, but it has revised interior and souped up gear. Like all previous Land Cruiser models, the new Toyota Land Cruiser offers full off-road capability, but in response to the growing demands of the customers, the strength in competition from the likes of BMW and Range Rover, this is anything but a utility vehicle. After 51 years of tackling and conquering some of the toughest terrains around the globe, Land Cruiser have been regarded as the benchmark of reliability and durability. You'd feel that you could saw one of these things in half and it'd still work. This baby is no soft sports utility. It retains the traditional 4x4 frame chassis and separate body construction for maximum rigidity and strength. The 3 liter D4D common rail turbo diesel, already among the most powerful and torquey in the sector, is carried over from the present model range and offers enormous torque with excellent fuel consumption. More than 4 million Land Cruisers have been sold worldwide with over 200,000 customers in Europe alone. Current UK sales for the outgoing Colorado model are around 1,300 units per year. And Toyota tell us that they hope the new model will double that. Now some of the overseas manufacturers like BMW, Mercedes and Ferrari aren't here at the show with a particular stand. But that just gives more room to MG Rover, the good old British company, to do some flag waving. And they've certainly got some excellent new cars on display. Like just behind me, the brand new MG X80. Well we took a look down to the factory to take a look at this new car and to talk to its designer, Peter Stevens. 
After MG Rover's turbulent time with BMW, the motoring world wondered what would be next for this troubled British giant. But following the English motto of keeping the stiffer upper lip, MG have fought their way through and have surprised us all with the quality and excitement of their Z range of cars. With all these models being well received, they're clearly going from strength to strength, and their latest car, the X80, reinforces this. The revitalised MG Rover Group first allowed us a glimpse of the X80 at the Frankfurt Motor Show in 2001. With styling and stats to make you drool, you'll not be disappointed with MG's offering. The new car falls into the luxury sports coupe genre, with sleek flowing lines, a long bonnet and low stance. MG wanted a bigger sports offering than its current MGF, and the X80 will fill this hole with ease. The looks of the car have gone down very well at the NEC, with many attendees gawking this new car. The X80 was styled by Peter Stevens, MG Rover's world-renowned designer, who was responsible for the McLaren F1. We spoke to Peter and asked him how he founded the idea of the car. The idea for the X80 started with the fact that what MG Rover did was to buy a company in Italy called Cavalli, who produced a car called the Mangusta. And we wanted to expand the range of vehicles that MG has for sale. That was an ideal thing to do as a starting point because a lot of the homologation was already done with that vehicle and that's a slow and lengthy process that's also expensive. So it kind of got us ahead a long way by buying the company. We then produced a car which we showed at Frankfurt last year, which we called X80. And it was one of those kind of projects where when you've started it, it gains a kind of momentum of its own. And it, it was almost like the car took us into a market area where we realised we didn't want to be. The mesh coverings over the large grille look great. The overall shape looks like the SVT Mustang, with its wedge shape and quad exhausts. And it's not surprising to hear that MG expect the US car buyer will play a large role in the future of this car. The brief was, you know, to have something exciting within a very short period of time, and a car that we could then put into small production and would make us some money. So it was nice, simple brief. A lot of trust in me, I have to say, which was great. The front headlight cluster together with the large fog lights are very chic, with the tail lights looking very stylistic. The car has a long bonnet, and the lovely low-profile 17-inch alloys really set the car off. Well, sadly, they actually haven't let me drive the X80, but I have been for a drive in the latest MG ZT. Now, in the past, beefed-up MGs have not really fired up the imagination. And with the exception of the Metro and Maestro turbos, the MGs of the 80s were really just rebadged Austin Rovers. <sighs> Well, although the MG ZT is obviously a Rover 75 underneath, it's definitely not for popping out to the shops for your pension or your pipe tobacco. Because the stock Rover 75 has had a stiffened and lowered chassis, bigger wheels and bigger brakes, quicker steering, and the top spec V6 engine is tuned to produce a hefty 190 horsepower. Surely then, a car worthy of the MG Octagon. The interior of a car this nature is very, very important. Why? Well, kids in the back screaming and shouting, piles and piles of luggage, and the possibility of a nagging spouse of either gender. What you don't need is a poor cabin to add to that stress. MG Rover have done a great job in here. Don't think that the flimsy, slightly tacky interiors of the smaller Rovers has been emulated. This cabin is worthy of a Jag. Very stylish, very well put together, and very well equipped. And the carbon effect trim really works well. No doubt about it, this interior is much better than the Rover 75, which was a little bit oldie-worldy for my kind of liking. No, this is updated, slick and stylish, and really does have a feel of quality that would rival some more expensive cars. The model I'm driving today is the top spec 2.5 litre V6, and as saloon cars go, it boasts some pretty impressive stats. 0 to 60 in just over 8 seconds. Top speed of 137 miles an hour with all the good carrying capacity and practicality. The on road price for the car is normally 21,410, but if you want all the extras that this car has, it will set you back somewhat steeper 26 grand, which gets you the metallic paint, sunroof, part leather seats, a stereo upgrade, and a few other bits and pieces. But personally, I reckon the base V6 is more than adequate. Now, V6 engines aren't the most frugal for long motorway journeys, but that lack of economy is made up for in excitement. This is a very responsive car. 
There's a lovely burbling sound under acceleration and bags of torque for pulling out of corners or pulling your caravan, whichever you prefer. But it all adds to the overall sporty feeling of this car. As does the ride, which is a great balance of comfort and performance. It's not too hard that it jars over the slightest bumps and ripples in the road, yet it is firm enough to cope with the harder cornering and acceleration that you'd want with this sort of vehicle. In the style stakes, I reckon it's another success for MG Rover. Although, as I've said, the ZT is obviously a Rover 75 with a body kit added, it's done in such a way that it really flows together and creates a really aggressive and purposeful look. So there you have it. The MG Rover ZT really is a competent and great performing car, and it's genuinely sporty too. So it's a real feather in Rover's cap. Makes you proud to be British, doesn't it? So the MG ZT is very impressive, whichever way you look at it. And the engine really is superb. 0 to 60 in 8.2 seconds and a top speed of 137 miles an hour give it great performance, and a chassis really does give you a sporty yet comfortable ride. Running costs are also good, with insurance group of 15 and reasonably priced servicing, as don't forget, this car is based on the tried and tested Rover 75. Now we're all well aware of the amazing stunt work of Russ Swift. He's the guy that of course had those classic minis in the Italian job, the famous film. Now you wouldn't expect the brand new BMW Mini to be performing those sorts of stunts, but here at the NEC, we're about to be proved wrong. That's some pretty impressive stunts there. And uh, Russ, uh, again, excellent stuff. But um, how chuckable is this particular car? You make it look very easy. Oh, it's, uh, it's fantastic. It's, it's been uh, designed to be a worthy uh, a successor to the old Mini. It, it handles like a dream. Very wide track, very low centre of gravity, and, uh, and all the in essential ingredients are there. As we've mentioned, we've already mentioned that great Italian job. Those cars, though, a long time ago, different cars, how different were they in compared to uh, using the, the capabilities of them? Uh, the, the old Mini was very much designed as a utility car. This is a very sophisticated car indeed. The suspension and everything is, uh, is, is uh, very highly developed and, uh, and, and it's the state of the art. Well, you've got to be kept on your toes because I hear you're not the only Swift now at this. Yes, I've got somebody uh, nibbling at my heels at the moment. My son is 23 now. He's been uh, driving with me uh, since he was seven. He, uh, he started on our family ride on a lawnmower, driving on two wheels, and he's been all over the world with us since then, and uh, he's virtually full-time with me now. Well, don't teach him all the tricks. <laughs> I'll hold something back. Well, Russ, obviously we've seen you over the years driving lots of different cars in stunts. What uh, are the easiest or hardest uh, to do? The cars just get better and better and easier to drive. Power steering makes a big difference to my job now. Uh, as long as the handbrake works and, and the car handles, uh, I, I, I can use anything really. But these new Minis are really sharp and, uh, and a great, great fun to drive. So the Mini's still probably the easiest to do? Uh, yes, it's, you know, the Mini's always been the ultimate uh, car for this type of work and I think it still is. Now, I know this is just one of several cars that you actually take on stunts and uh, you've been here all day at the Motor Show and you've still got a grin on your face, you must still enjoy it. I've been doing this a long time now and I enjoy it every bit now as I ever did. And where else are you going? Uh, we're off to Singapore Motor Show next, we've just been to the New York Motor Show, uh, I don't know what happens after that, I've forgotten. <laughs> well fair enough, well let's hope you keep it well on the straight and narrow as they say, thanks for talking to Thank us. you. Now this is going to become a tough competitor with the world's top-selling luxury car, the Mercedes S-Class. Because this is the brand new Jaguar XJ, due to go on sale in the UK in early 2003, with overseas versions following several months later. Jaguar are absolutely pinning their hopes on the new XJ to beat the very stiff competition from their executive car market. This is without doubt the most sophisticated model Jaguar have ever made having invested almost three years in creating this car. This model has a frame which instead of being welded together has been bonded with aerospace glues, very similar to the Lotus Elise and the Vanquish from Aston Martin. But the killer punch is the use of aluminium, which means that the weight has been brought down 400 pounds lighter than the current XJ model.
Now, I'm a big Jaguar fan myself, and I believe this new XJ has all the elegance and tradition you'd expect from Jaguar, but it's also packed with all the latest technology that you need to get ahead in the 21st century. I can't wait to get behind the wheel of this baby. Now, throughout the show, we've seen some pretty wacky, innovative concept cars, but how about this? It's the GM Autonomy, and this is a real chameleon. You could put it in your garage overnight and come out with something completely different the next day. Inside your garage, the idea is that you simply remove the old body shell and clip on the new one to ring in the changes. Now, although this seems a good idea, nobody has quite worked out yet where you store all the spare body shells or just how you clip on the body without specialized equipment. But these are mere details. The General Motors Autonomy, the car that has many identities. Tremendous. What will they think of next? Well, that's it for part two, but join us for more from the Birmingham International Car Show after this. Hello and welcome back to the British International Motor Show from the NEC, which is open to the public until November 3rd. Now I'm back on the Volkswagen stand now, in front of what at first glance perhaps looked like a Passat, but that's where you'd be wrong, because this is much bigger and much posher, because this is the brand new Volkswagen Phaeton. The Phaeton name comes from the Greek mythology. Wasn't Phaeton the son of Helios, who stole a ride in his father's sun chariot? Well, boys, if your dad gets one of these, I doubt he'd be too keen to let you motor around town with your mates, because this is something very special. Ten years ago, if you had said that Volkswagen were going to enter the luxury market, people would have thought you were joking. But today, the likes of BMW and Mercedes aren't laughing. If you thought that the build quality of the new Golf and Passat were good, check out the Phaeton. This baby is lovingly assembled at an incredible state-of-the-art factory in Dresden, where the only oil stains you'll see will be the sardines in the five-star canteen. This car offers a range of engines, but the 3.2-litre V6 option looks the best value. After all, 241 brake horsepower is enough for decent acceleration, isn't it? Reaching 145 miles per hour like a rocket, this car offers hush luxurious travel on long-haul journeys to ensure hassle executives arrive unruffled. Well, with me now is Paul Bucket, the head of press and public relations for Volkswagen here in the UK. And Paul, first question with the Phaeton is, why do you feel that Volkswagen need to get into the luxury market when your sister company Audi already does that? It was uh, Volkswagen's intention to span all parts of the passenger car market, and uh, now the Phaeton here and the Touareg uh, 4x4 vehicle bring us almost complete uh, Volkswagen's representation in the passenger car market. And what particularly about this particular vehicle here are you proud of in terms of its features? The aim was to make the best luxury car in the marketplace. So this vehicle was designed around speeds of 300 kilometers an hour, quite academic, approaching 200 miles an hour. But if you can make a car that is quiet, um, stable, with braking systems and propulsion systems um, that are competent at this sort of speed, which is 50 kilometers an hour above the design speed for other luxury cars, you will have a product which will excel um, for the driver in all areas. Well, Paul, why would buy people buy the uh, Phaeton, let's say, compared to the Audi A8, which has probably got similar qualities? Um, for the same reason that customers might buy an Audi A4 or a Volkswagen Passat. Both these products compete with each other and they both um, actually have increased their market shares uh, against um, competitors. So there's no reason why this shouldn't be a success and, and that the Audi A8 shouldn't equally be successful. What's the feedback you've got so far? Well, very positive. Only a limited number of journalists have, um, have driven it, and these are people who are real product experts, and, and they're telling us that we've probably got uh, one of the best cars that money can buy from a technical standpoint. Sounds good. Thanks for talking to us again, Paul. Thank you very much. Minority Report with Tom Cruise and the scene where Tom's trying to escape the authorities and he actually hides in an automated car factory and the best thing is that he survives while the car is spot welded around him. Well, here is one of those cars from the movie.
Well, we don't have Tom Cruise, but we have the next best thing is we've got David Brinson, who's the marketing director for Lexus. And I often wonder when I see a concept car like this, especially when it's seen in a movie, how you actually get involved in the movie business. How did Lexus get involved with this movie? Well, Steven Spielberg was the director for Minority Report, and he approached us, basically. He owns Lexus, he apparently loves Lexus, and he came up to us and said, can we do a car? And every car in the movie was a Lexus. That's a big plus. Steven's got a view that uh, in the future, every car will be a Lexus. OK, this was a concept, but how far from a possible reality in the future could this be? Well, some of the technology we talk about in the film and in the car potentially will be there in the future. We talk about the car being powered by a hydrogen fuel cell, and in the future we believe that cars will be powered by hydrogen. So it's a portent of what we believe will be future technology in areas like that. Each, each wheel is driven by an independent electric motor, and it's got various kinds of uh, high-tech wizardry in it, such as collision avoidance radar and things like that. So it's designed to really sort of how we would imagine things to be. So do you think this is something we could possibly see from Lexus in the future? Well, the film was set in 2054, so there's a long time to go then for design, so who knows? All right, well, thanks for talking to us, Dave. Pleasure. Now, we've seen some pretty interesting concept cars in the show so far, but now it's time to cross over to the Citroen Hall to see their latest concept, which is the C-Crosser. Come with me. Now, here's a concept car you might have seen on the Howard Stapleford's concept car series, but this is the first time we've actually seen it in the metal. Now, although the design is a little bit strange, it's actually won the concept car of the show. But the concept itself, you can't even see. But this is a drive-by-wire vehicle. Why have mechanical linkages when a computer and wires can do it all for you? This means that if you get bored driving at the front, instead of all the messing about trying to find a lay-by to swap over the driver's seat when it's safe, you can simply pass the steering wheel to your friend. Drive-by-wire technology means that it doesn't matter where the steering wheel is, because there's no mechanical linkages. You could, in theory, drive this from the back seat, although I'm sure the local police would have a word or two to say about that. The Citroen C-Crosser is designed to place its focus on living space. Plus, all the passengers are slightly higher to give them a panoramic view of the road. And that impression is reinforced by the glass roof, which forms a continuous line with the windscreen. You often notice concept cars with huge glass roofs, but it's unusual for a feature like this to make it to production, as they can't make glass tough enough to pass safety legislation rules. The C-Crosser, the concept car from France, aimed at drivers who have a taste for adventure and freedom. Well, it's all very well looking at these shiny new cars here at the NEC, but how are you going to protect your investment? Now, most new cars are fitted with security systems, but let's face it, they still get nicked. So that's why there's so many high-tech systems for retrieving your precious wheels, like Tracker. Colin Patterson's from Tracker, and a tracking satellite system for retrieving a car is all very well, but if the thief takes it underground, surely it's all over. Well, you mentioned satellite, and a lot of people will be surprised to hear it, but Tracker's success over the last 10 years has not been based on using satellite as a technology. We have employed land-based radio transmission, which actually gives the extra benefit of being able to pinpoint a stolen vehicle, whether it's concealed in a container, a garage, or perhaps concealed underground. The weakness with satellite is, unfortunately, once you block the signal and the ability to see the sky, the ability to position a vehicle using satellite alone is highly restricted. And does it have a very good rate of success? Yes, we've enjoyed a very successful 10 years in business and we've enjoyed our most successful year to date. Uh, our recovery rates stand firm and uh, we're very proud of our market leadership position. And I believe you have a system here in the car park that we can take a look at. That's right, the system is operated by all of the UK's 52 police forces and we have a couple of friendly police officers who are happy to demonstrate the system right now. All right, thanks a lot. Well, let's take a look at how it works. So here we are outside, we've got a real police car, two real policemen with the tracking device and Phil over here in our Beetle which is about to be stolen and in a few moments time we're going to find out whether we can catch him. Well as you can see we're back in the warmth of the NEC once again and at the Citroen stand. Now if you didn't get to go to the Paris show, well Citroen have brought it all here and this is the brand new C3 Pure Real. And obviously the designers at Citroen are big fans of the old robot cartoon series Transformers. And although this isn't a robot in disguise, it certainly can change its identity quite drastically and it's quite a unique vehicle. The Plurial shares some aspects of the C3, which has recently freshened up the city car sector. 
but in this version it has the ability to morph from a four-seater saloon into several other configurations. Click a button and a huge sunroof of the saloon can be opened up to eight different positions. And without any pesky center pillars, you can create what Citroen call the panoramic mode. But then you can retract the rear window and sunroof under the boot floor. And it's now the Puriel Cabriolet. It's magic, but that's not all. If you take the side pillars away, Citroen call this spider version. Okay, they're pushing their luck a little bit with the description, but fold the rear seats down and fiddle with the boot area and you get what they describe as a pickup. Well, not exactly, but this version may be quite useful for you. The Citroen Plurial has loads of onboard toys from automatic headlights, wipers and automatic rear heater to an intelligent air conditioning system. It'll come in in just a single trim version, but has the choice of two petrol engines, a 1.4 and also a 1.6, which will have the new patented Senso Drive gearbox, which we have yet to try out. The whole package looks fantastic. There's only one real problem I can see. With such a mixed identity, just what will you put in the little box in the insurance form that asks for type of car? All right then, a couple of minutes has gone by and Phil has sped off into the distance somewhere into the car park in that Beetle. And now we're gonna try and find him if we can. Right, well, we're in pursuit now. We've got the track assist to him. And Ian, how does this all work then? Well, essentially, uh, our vehicle is fitted with a tracker detection device. Um, the stolen car has a, a secret um, radio transmitter fitted inside it. And at present, it's set, sending out a signal which this is interpreting and showing us where the vehicle is. How foolproof is it? Um, well, every time that we pick up a signal, we will find the vehicle. It's that effective. Essentially, the system is uh, fairly formproof. Um, we just follow the signal uh, until it, we reach the vehicle and find its location. And because it's radio waves, no matter where they've hidden the vehicle, whether it be in an underground car park, whether it be inside um, lock-up garages, um, people have even been known to uh, to place tin foil over the vehicle uh, to attempt to uh, camouflage the radio signal being emitted. However, uh, it doesn't work. Wherever they've hidden the vehicles, we found them. As you can see, how it works is that there's a strength indicator along the left-hand side, um, and as those bars reach the top, it goes into a local signal, which then gives us a further strength indicator. There's also a, a circle of dots around the outside, uh, and what my driver is doing at the moment is he's following the circle, and where the, the light is, he's aiming the vehicle in that direction, so that as we get closer to the car, these bars will light up higher and higher until we become next to the vehicle. And while Phil is arrested, Phil, he should be ashamed of himself. Well, there's no amount of gadgets can actually stop just good common sense parking. But there's no question about it that gadgets like these really are an advancement in stopping those thieves. This is the legendary GT40, the Ford classic that roared into the lives of car nuts everywhere in the 1960s, winning a pile of trophies and a great deal of admiration from drivers worldwide. Jay Mays, Ford Vice President of Design, calls the GT40 the ultimate living legend. Well, the legend is going to live on with the creation of this GT40 concept for 2002. The 40 of the original, of course, is its height in inches. This new concept should really be called the GT44. And not only is it four inches taller, but it's longer and generally a beefier vehicle in all ways. The concept has the same overall look of the original legend. The modern interpretation, however, has many improvements from sleek aerodynamics to fiber optic headlights. With 18 inch wheels at the front and 19 inch wheels at the rear, there are also distinctive cooling scoops that take in fresh air to the powerful engine inside. Plus, in the tradition of performance race cars, the doors cut into the roof line. The weight is kept down by forgetting poncy frills like power windows. This Ford machine has been designed for pure, refined performance. Now, although the GT40 isn't on display here at the show, there's plenty of performance cars representing Ford. How about this, for example, a look into the future of rally with Ford. Now, this car is roughly based on the Fiesta. Yes, the mild-mannered Fiesta, 
Well, this tarmac-hugging mean monster could be coming to a rally near you in the not-too-distant future. Well, there really is so much to see from the British International Motor Show, and the show finishes on November 3rd. But that's it for our Car File Special. I'm Jonathan Green. We'll see you next time.